so uh, thank you, Constantina. Then I think it's uh, my part now to uh, to continue. And um, uh, thank you, Shao and Georg, for the invitation. It's um, fun to be here. And uh, so now let me share my screen. Okay, so um, a brief look into 3D audio. Um, I'm uh, not going uh, very much in technical detail and uh, I'm not planning to answer lots of questions, but rather to raise some questions. And then I'm looking forward as uh, Constantina to the discussion uh, after the presentation. So uh, what I'm uh, going to, to talk about briefly is uh, three topics. Uh, number one, how we perceive the environment, the three-dimensional auditory environment, and how we recreate it by technical means. Uh, then um, about some metaphoric spatial properties of sound. And then um, finally, a very short look onto what this might mean for uh, composing in space. Uh, starting with this beautiful quote by Charles Darwin, has the oyster a necessary notion of space? Uh, um, likely not, because um, space does not um, have a, a, sp a specific um, meaning in the life of, of an oyster, I guess, but it does have in our lives. So... Um, uh, how do we perceive space? Um, uh, first, uh, we uh, perceive space by auditory objects explicitly. So uh, the spatial relation between two sounds in space creates space. Um, and uh, so the, this is um, uh, one property of the perceived auditory scene or acoustical scene mostly through distance and direction in the horizontal plane. So our, our um, auditory perception is optimized for the horizontal plane. Um, this is what um, we might call sonic envelopment. Uh, and then number two, um, we perceive space um, by um, means of reflections from room boundaries. Um, which um, gives us an implicit sensation of being in a space, in a closed space. This is what uh, we might call spatial envelopment. I'm following here the terminology of Jan Berg. Um, I, he's a scholar at, uh, in, in Sweden at um, uh, Lulea, PTA Lulea Technical University. Um, then uh, the, this is the the real situation, our physical environment. And then, of course, we can create this uh, technically. We can create an illusion of space. Um, and um, what's quite remarkable is that perceptual representations of the physical space are evoked even if the physical simulation is limited. For example, even if uh, we are doing this in stereo, just in stereo. So... Um, a proper stereophonic recording of, say, a concert in a beautiful concert hall or church gives us the three-dimensional impression of this space, of the, the music and the musicians and the surrounding uh, architecture, uh, although uh, the, the playback is, is just uh, from two points in our living room. So... Um, Space might be created or the, the, the illusion of space might be created via monophonic playback or stereophonic playback or so-called 3D or spatial playback. Um, I'm not distinguishing here, but maybe if, uh, if um, you're interested, we might discuss this later between different approaches like channel-based, scene-based or object-based uh, 3D audio. Uh, but then it could be also headphones playback, binaurally or not, or transaural. Uh, and then, um, of course, finally, we can uh, discuss um, auditory augmented reality or virtual reality. 
Um, so, um, a bit, um, some, some short remarks on uh, how we orientate in space, how we um, localize sound sources in the physical environment. In the horizontal plane, directional cues in the horizontal plane, the very well-known uh, so-called spatial cues are number one, the interaural time difference, number two, the interaural level difference. Um, this leads to technology um, with, um, I'm, I'm calling it here psychoacoustic technology, but uh, it's like half um, physics, application of physics and half application of psychology. Um, best known uh, stereo, the stereophonic recording and playback system, um, which was uh, once 1931 um, invented by Alan Bloomline, a BBC engineer, uh, and he actually filed a patent on stereophony. Um, and then, of course, um, we can go one step further to surround or quadraphonic playback, surround playback, so-called 3D. Um, and what all those systems have in common is the idea of phantom images um, that appear in between some playback loudspeakers and um, uh, that we can perceive the size of the virtual source. Uh, and uh, I'm borrowing this term apparent source width from architectural acoustics. Um, and then there are some spectral cues as spatial cues um, due to the, the uh, influence of head and the external ears, the pinne, to the sound field and the torso as well. And uh, this is what we call the head-related transfer function or the head-related impulse response. And the complete head-related transfer function, of course, includes uh, the uh, interaural time and level differences. And this leads to some more like physical mo modeling technologies, uh, like dummy head recording, binaural rendering, transaural rendering, which means binaural played back via loudspeakers, uh, or uh, VRAR technologies uh, with or without head tracking. Um, in the vertical plane, um, the interaural time differences, interaural level differences vanish, so there are no more interaural differences in the vertical plane. Uh, so uh, the um, directional perception the, um, in the vertical plane is uh, exclusively due to uh, head and ears and torso, so the, the external ears. Um, when we're uh, working with uh, 3D audio, uh, then uh, the, the basic um, idea might be to um, create auditory objects with uh, specific distances and directions. Um, so distances um, would be uh, typically created mainly through level and spectral cues. I'm um, calling this here relative to an internalized concept because um, we can perceive the distance of an object if we know the sound, if we know how it sounds, then um, uh, we, we um, can um, imagine it in a certain position in space. So uh, this um, we might call this the perceptual constancy um, following the uh, constancy of the environment. So if, uh, for example, we hear a voice, um, someone speaking in the real world, in the real physical world, then uh, we can uh, quite exactly tell where this person is and in which um, distance uh, this person is simply due to uh, levels and, uh, and uh, the, the spectral content of the voice. Uh, and indoors, there's one more um, distance cue, 
uh, which is uh, the direct to diffuse ratio uh, and the specific reflection patterns. So, um, which is uh, to me um, a, a bit of, uh, of a magic of our um, perception of, of auditory perception that we have an extremely, extremely complex uh, and uh, chaotic sound field indoors in an enclosed environment. But uh, this does not uh, lead to like uh, confusion or disorientation, but exactly the other way around, uh, uh, our perception uh, can calculate quite exactly our relative position in the space and the positions of other sources in the space from this super chaotic patterns. Um, and this leads to, um, if, if we uh, implement this in technology, uh, leads to levels and equalizers and artificial reverb to um, then create the, um, the illusion of distance. And again, perceptual constancies. So uh, quite interesting. So if we don't know the source or if there are no hints, uh, of the the um, of uh, how a source might sound like, uh, then we simply cannot perceive the distance. Uh, so a short recapitulation: um, the explicit perception of space, we're perceiving the auditory scene as it is, or we hope we hope that we perceive it as it is. <laughs> Um, and we're perceiving things in space, so the apparent physical world, and um, investigating this way of uh, perceiving the environment is subject to this uh, classical psychoacoustics. But then uh, some, some question um, will then arise like, um, can we localize a sine wave? No, we cannot. Um, can we localize a sine wave with a distinct Edge, so a sound wave that starts, ah, oh, that might be better, um, and and so on and so on. Um, the voice of an alien animal, quite interesting. Um, a flute in an AB stereo recording. This is uh, one of the uh, the the um, most complex questions for tone masters. <laughs> so uh, never record a, a high flute in. A, B, or spaced um, microphone setting, because this can lead to very confusing uh, localizations. Okay, uh, then um, uh, second, uh, perceiving the, the 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 implicit space, the um, this the passive space, the walls. How? Uh, what's the impact of the walls? Uh, it, um, the walls create reflection patterns. Um, so uh, this gives rise to perceiving the volume of the architectural space. So we actually can hear the volume and we can hear the materiality of specific surfaces. Um, I'm, uh, I think I will skip this here because so the precedence effect or law of the first wavefront, uh, this is... Um, specific idea of uh, how we perceive uh, reflections or secondary sounds that uh, come within a specific, um, with a specific delay. So if the specific delay is shorter than, uh, than 30 milliseconds, then uh, this is, um, then, then we, we start to, for example, hear a wall. If it uh, comes later than maybe 30 milliseconds or 10 or 100 milliseconds, but it's in this range, roughly, then we might hear an echo. Um, and then the diffuse sound, the super chaotic diffuse sound in an enclosed space um, is um, a hint for our perception uh, to let us know the again the volume of the architectural space and the average materiality of all surfaces so we can hear if we are in a room with hard surfaces or with rather soft surfaces we can hear 
if uh, a space is built from wood or from brick or from concrete or glazed tiles or so this this is something that we can actually hear and then um uh, third point is uh, resonances or interferences due to standing waves specifically in small spaces so this um gives might give us the impression of narrowness of a space um, we can simulate this with a delay or reverb with electromechanic reverbs or, or digital reverbs algorithmic or convolution reverbs modeling the behavior of the real world there's um, um, quite interesting um, observation by Arthur Bennett, uh, something that he calls the generalized precedence effect. Um, and uh, he sums this up as a good violin sounds um, like a good violin um, also in a bad room. So um, the, the room itself or the secondary sounds um, actually affects the signal a lot. It might affect the signal so so much that, uh, for example, if we would record this and compare uh, some some acoustical properties, we might not be able to distinguish between the signals. But uh, then uh, our perception uh, simply subtract uh, subtracts this, and. Um, uh, so, so uh, th this is uh, one one um, property of our perception that uh, helps us to orientate in closed spaces in noisy environments. Um, that helps us to recognize a voice, basically, in very different acoustic environments. And uh, if you're um, into music, then you might even recognize a specific instrument um, in some individual instrument in different acoustic environments. Uh, short recapitulation on this. Uh, so we perceive space by means of reflected sound, um, the boundaries of spaces. Uh, and again, this is uh, perceiving the apparent physical world. And this also is subject to classical psychoacoustics. Now, um, Following um, Barry Blesser and Linda Ruth Salter, when music is reproduced electronically, a listener actually experiences a hybrid comprising at least three sets of spatial attributes. Number one, the acoustics of the performance space where the music was recorded. Number two, acoustics added during the mixing process when the music was prepared. And number three, the acoustics of the listening space where the music is actually heard. Um, so we are uh, typically listening to like super um, positions of spaces. And again, our perception is capable of subtracting um, certain elements. So typically when we, for example, listen to a recording in our living room, then our perception likely will subtract the acoustical properties of the living room so that uh, we finally don't hear um, some musicians playing in our living room, but rather our living room uh, like being inside a church, if we're, for example, listening to a choir recorded in a church. Um, Gernot Böhme in his book uh, on the aesthetics of atmospheres, uh, writes acoustical spaces are not identical with the real space, but uh, experienced in the real space. And uh, th this is uh, then, I, I guess, um, a, a connection to uh, to the, the idea of AR and VR. Uh, so um, setting up two loudspeakers, a stereo system in the living room, um, and superimposing a, a virtual sound field with a, a virtual space into my actual space is some kind of augmented reality. So I'm augmenting the actual space with uh, some virtual space. Um, this is always the case uh, unless we are working with headphones. 
and blocking the actual uh, three-dimensional acoustical environment. Um, okay, so, um, so far about the real space and how we perceive it. And now um, let's um, go one step further, one step beyond the, this classical psychoacoustics. How do we think of sound? How do we talk of sound? Um, typically, when we talk of sound, we're, we're talking in, uh, so uh, 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 this is quite remarkable. So hearing like, like um, uh, olfactoric perception uh, has, and very much like, like taste has um, little to no um, vocabulary that we don't have words for the, uh, the sensation of sound. Uh, we do have lots of words for visual perception, but we don't have words for, for hearing. So we have to talk about the sensation of sound in different ways. And typically we would use onomatopoeia or we uh, would um, use um, references to the physical world or we would um, talk about like metaphoric materialities, but then um, very typically we use cross-modal metaphors and this, um, so I'm, I'm pre presenting here some examples in different languages. We have those uh, cross-modal metaphors in all languages and it's um, uh, also in all languages uh, the case that we have little to zero vocabulary of hearing. Um, but then we have those metaphors. And uh, so we are thinking of sound in a visual way and we are thinking of sound in a haptic way. Um, Lakoff and Johnson uh, state, once we can identify our experiences as entities or substances, we can refer to them, categorize them, group them and quantify them. And by this means reason about them. So uh, let us uh, go back to the, to, uh, the, how we perceive sound in space. That's the thingness of the sound. Uh, I'm picking here this fancy picture from, from this weird YouTube tutorial uh, aimed at amateurs producing music. Uh, and no one would question um, a, a picture like this. So yes, the, this is like uh, the, the, this is how the music looks like. And uh, please note that the bass is bigger and uh, a bit lower in space, as for example the snare, or and the cymbals are quite high in space. Uh, so why that? So we do not hear sound. We do not perceive the sound field, but. Uh, what we actually perceive is a hypothesis of the source or the origin of the sound externalized as an object in space. Um, this is what um, um, Pierre Schaeffer and uh, Michel Chion call causal listening. Uh, so we're hearing um, the door, um, but not the sound. So we're categorizing the, the, the sounds according to the objects that create the sounds. And um, the auditory object is perceived as a bounded physical object in space, a tangible and bounded physical object in space. And this boundedness is maybe uh, the, the um, most specific thing about how we perceive sound because the sound field itself is by no means bounded. It's uh, like, pervading the whole space. Um, but we can actually hear the size of when, for example, when we're mixing hip hop, then we can hear the size of the guitar and the cymbal. So, um, um, and um, these things, these auditory objects then have like visual and haptic properties, like a specific size, a height in space, a specific shape, and brightness, among others. 
Which, by the way, uh, leads to uh, the, the beautiful conclusion that mono is 3D because um, when I'm setting up one loudspeaker and playing back one sound, then I am actually perceiving an object in space, which is 3D. So I'm perceiving 3D. Um, the 3D audio systems, the more complicated, complex 3D audio playback systems or production systems, then simply allow me to position the this uh, auditory object wherever I want. Um, okay, so um, about the cross-modal perception, sound can be metaphorically high or low. This is uh, also called this, the spatial musical asso associations uh, of response codes or uh, a sp a space pitch um, associations of response codes, this specific effect that we are um, uh, like connecting a pitch or spectral weight with um, a position, a vertical position in space. A sound can be metaphorically small or large um, or thick or thin. There are languages where thick and thin are linguistic Uh, metaphors of pitch um, and um, say in, in English we, we don't have this metaphor we're not metaphorizing pitch as thickness but we then call the, the, the sound of the bass drum fat and then we know what, what uh, how this should sound like um, and then uh, and of course uh, size and thickness are related And then uh, sound can be edgy or round, it can be sharp, and of course it can be bright or dark. It can uh, also be warm or cold, but I'm skipping this here. Um, so the, the metaphors I'm referring uh, to here are like well known since the 1980s investigated. This is ongoing research, so the, the latest um, uh, paper I'm Uh, I'm referring to is uh, just two years uh, ago, one roughly one year ago, um, and uh, the so the this is um, a topic to research in uh, cognitive psychology mainly. Um, we might say the uh, the language that we're using reflects the way we perceive sound, and uh, this is basically then rooted in. Um, neural connections in our brain. So we actually hear in visual um, dimensions. We, we perceive in visual dimensions and in haptic dimensions. Um, and then it, it uh, gets quite interesting because um, we cannot actually distinguish between the physical and the metaphorical properties of the auditory object. So the size of the auditory object is mainly a um, um, metaphoric property due to uh, spectral content, the frequencies, the dominant frequencies of the signal. But then uh, we can also manipulate this. You, you remember the introduction uh, with the so-called apparent source width, which um, simply lets us perceive um, 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 a voluminous uh, source in space um, and uh, we cannot actually distinguish between the two and um, most famous is the so-called pitch height effect or Pratt's effect uh, which was uh, first described by Carol Pratt in 1930 and since then has been successfully reproduced that uh, we are perceiving a high frequency content likely higher in space and low frequency content likely lower in space. So, um, and short recapitulation here about metaphoric and metaphorical and physical space. The height and the size of the auditory object have each a perceived physical and a metaphoric dimension. I uh, call this here the perceived physical dimension because the um, we have no access to the, to the real physical dimension uh, just through our perception. 
So um, um, actually, there there is not this big difference between the perceived physical world and the metaphors that are evoked in um, in our cognition. The movement of um, an auditory object uh, can have complex metaphoric dimension. Uh, uh, so um, it can we, we can um, we are imagining movement according to pitch, but also according to temporal structures uh, like the, um, um, the the intrinsic movement of of a melody, for example. Uh, besides. Again, it's perceived physical dimension. So um, uh, we we can uh, have like when when we're when we're using a, a spatial audio or three D audio as a creative tool, then we can play with all this metaphoric movement and physical movement and metaphoric height and physical height, metaphoric size and physical size. Um, the intensity as well as the low frequency content both refer to the metaphor of size uh, or uh, both are linked to um, uh, cross modally linked uh, with the size uh, perception of size uh, but they are as well distance cues if you remember um, now the the short introduction on uh, spatial cues, the distance cues, um, the, the spectral cues, and the level. So uh, this is, of course, um, then, for example, quite common in, in film sound design if you want to, to uh, create the impression that something is very close and in front of the screen, then bring the level up and bring the bass up, then it might appear uh, before the loudspeaker, so before the actual physical event. Um, and then the auditory object may have a metaphoric shape and metaphoric haptics, a metaphoric surface, like it can be soft or rough or sharp or edgy or round and so on. One open question is uh, if the auditory object can he uh, have a perceived physical shape. So uh, could we distinguish between um, different geometrical or, uh, structures in space, which is, by the way, topic uh, of research right now in uh, in Atavi. Um, finally, quoting Katrin Fahlenbrach. Uh, from uh, her book um, uh, Audiovisuelle Metaphern, Audiovisual Metaphors, perceived space is basically, basically different from physical space. We are not measuring physical properties of space, but we perceive the environment with regard to our options of behavior or in interaction with the environment. Specifically meaningful are, for example, sizes of objects and their relations and distances. And this, of course, then opens the discussion to um, embodied perception, embodied cognition, ideas, concepts in, um, in audio and specifically in spatial audio. So, um, uh, what uh, could this all mean finally in, uh, for, for uh, composing with space or for utilizing spatial audio? Uh, for sound design or music, composition, um, uh, spatial concepts, um, referring to the spatial relations of auditory objects, could be like up and down, close or distant, so playing with the, the, um, the height, and then of course the uh, related conceptual metaphors of height, which are so uh, uh, like, according to Larkov and Johnson, like uh, up is good and uh, down uh, is, is bad uh, or um, conscious is up, unconscious is down. Uh, so uh, concepts like this are of course related to, um, to the pitch of the sound, 
uh, all sound designers who are into um, like uh, dramatic low pitched sound effects know this and all music producers who like fat bass drums know this but um, uh, then um, another open question might be uh, can we play with this uh, with these uh, conceptual metaphors with the um, with the literal spatial position of the sound then close and distant are of course very powerful spatial concepts um short remark here uh, it's a big difference if we're working with a loudspeaker playback or a headphones playback in principle in headphones playback it is possible to position a sound just in, in front of the nose or at the shoulder of the audience uh, and you you might uh, be familiar with asmr which has uh, lot to do with proximity. Um, in front, behind, uh, uh, in relation to the body, to the posture of the body, uh, central peripheral, so rather close or rather distant to my point of listening, inside, outside. Then spatial concepts um, referring to the perceived architectural space. Um, uh, the, this space can be, for example, large or small, it can be wide or narrow, can be low or high, which is, by the way, something uh, that uh, might call for true 3D or spatial audio technology. Uh, so it's not easy to, to uh, communicate architectural height with a two-dimensional playback. So it, it helps if we have a loudspeaker. Um, above our head. Space can be open or closed. So, um, summing this up, um, uh, some, some ideas of how to play with spatial audio. Uh, the vertical position, the distance and the size of the auditory object have a perceived physical and a metaphoric dimension. And these physical and metaphorical dimensions can be congruent or incongruent. But at least um, if we work with spatial audio, we should be aware of the congruency and should try to incorporate this as a creative means. Physical movement and spatial tra trajectory of auditory objects or meter objects, combinations of objects, again, can be congruent or incongruent with the intrinsic movement of the object that might be a tone, a melody, a abstract sound, whatever. Um, and then um, spatial composition might be might be uh, uh, become meaningful specifically through conceptual metaphors uh, that I have already mentioned. Like we are conceptualizing abstract uh, things in spatial dimensions, like uh, up and down and close and distant. Um, and uh, here comes a uh, hypothesis. The conceptual metaphors might be triggered by physical as well as cross-modally metaphorical properties of the auditory objects, the size, position, the movement. Um, and um, last, the conceptual metaphors might as well be triggered by the virtual architectural spaces. And there are some hints like from, um, from practical sound design or music production that um, uh, are actually an argument for this. So, uh, so far for, uh, for this um, brief outlook, um, I'm, I'm skipping here the literature on cross-modal correspondences. If you're, uh, I'm uh, just listing one, which is uh, Spence, uh, the tutorial review from 2011. If you're interested in this topic, I can provide you with, um, uh, with a list of literature and with papers. Thank you very much.